article along with other permanent members of the UN Security Council on one condition. It says that we can give guarantees to all the participants of the the Treaty of the Nuclear Weapon Free Zone in the Southeast Asia on the condition that all the participants of this agreement will fulfill its obligations, their obligations not to have, not to develop, not to deploy any elements of the nuclear weapons. I think this is an obvious thing to ask for. Because if anyone, if any of the participants all of a sudden they decide to violate their obligations, then the question of guarantees, absolute guarantees, then it will sound differently, it will look differently, especially since the risks, as it turns out, they exist. For example, Australia, it is a participant a signatory to another agreement, to another treaty on the nuclear free zone, and now in violation of their obligations, as we believe Australia, on their territory, they agreed with the Americans, with the Brits, to deploy elements of the infrastructure related to the nuclear weapons. And in situation like this, we cannot guarantee to a country, if any of the participants of the nuclear weapon free zone in the Southeast Asia will follow the same path like Australia. And the fact that the Americans would like to play such games with some of the member states, we have the reason to believe that they have such plans. Stoltenberg said that the alliance will work with partners from Europe and Asia against Russia and China. Does it come as a surprising or not anymore? And the second question, question Europeans at the Western media claiming wants to withdraw from the start. The parties blame each other on violating the agreement. Well, as for Stoltenberg, I know him since long. He says things as he sees them. Not the first time we hear such statements. I've already mentioned previously today that the doctrines of the US and of NATO say that Russia and China are a threat or a challenge. And now he is saying, he, he said in Vilnius, just this morning I read about it, that not only plans towards Russia and China, but relations between Russia and China are a threat to the North Atlantic Treaty. So they don't want us to have any relations whatsoever. I think this kind of path has no future. It confirms one more the relevance of the task that we set for ourselves and with our partners to counter the modern times colonialism attempts to preserve hegemony in global affairs and countering the direct violation of the principle of the UN Charter that I've mentioned on the need to respect and practice of the sovereign quality of all the states. NATO members, they are not ready to do this. So in everything they do, they show their attitude. And everyone can see that. And sometimes they have these Freudian sleeps of the tongue. For example, what Borrell said recently that Europe is a, is a garden and everything else is just a jungle, and we should treat it accordingly. I see no future for such policies. For some time, I think they will try to resist the trends of the world development, the global development, but I don't think they will prevail. Their policies will not prevail if we speak about the historic scope. But I guess for quite a long time, it can, it can take a lot of time. As for Ukraine, I'm not going to say anything because so much has been said. I think every person who can read, if uh, this person reads the declaration on the Ukraine and Vilnius, this person will understand everything. As for the joint plan of action on settling the Iranian nuclear program that was approved by the UN Security Council resolution. As you know, this agreement was destroyed, basically, undermined by the United States. 
that despite all the requirements of the UN Charter, they refused consensus-based resolution that was approved within the JCPOA. And when Biden took office, they said that they were ready to resume their participation in this program, but instead of just making a concrete decision on resuming in full scope of the resolution and of the JCPOA, they started bargaining, negotiating. They were trying to to get from their Iranian counterparts things that JCPOA is not covering to receive something bigger. So they were negotiating for quite a long time, but our Iranian counterparts, I think last August, when representatives of the European Union, so they put this document on the table that everyone were suppo was supposed to sign, Iran was ready to do this. And then the participants uh, from France, the UK and Germany, they were the ones to sign it afterwards. It's hard for me to judge what were the reasons behind their actions, but probably their desire to get something more out of the deal. And they saw that Iran was willing to agree, then they decided, well, let's then try to squeeze more out of this. I think it's not really realistic to see any progress in this regard anymore, because a year later there will be elections in the United States, there will be a new administration, no one knows what administration it will be, Republican or Democratic, but there is no guarantee that this new administration will try to use the same trick of withdrawing from the agreement that party has already reached. No one can say that for sure. At the negotiations to resume the JCPOA, the Iranian side asked directly the Americans when they were agreeing on the conditions. They said, let's put it down that this agreement will work forever for the entire duration and there will be no attempt to withdraw from this agreement by any party. The Americans refused to add this condition. We have our own system every four years. We have a new administration and they do not care about any previous agreements. That's why I'm not really optimistic about the possibility of resuming the JCPOA. But at the same time, with this stalling and uh, basically halted process, there are informal, unofficial, direct, behind-the-scenes contacts between Iranians and Americans on the matters of normalizing their relations, about unblocking on freezing the Iranian assets abroad that were legitimately frozen, uh, or, for example, the destinies of uh, American nationals in Iran that were accused of various crimes. We will only welcome normalization of this relation, but once again, it has not a lot to do with the JCPOA. It is known that after sending Azov commanders from Turkey to Kyiv, you talked to Hakan Fidan, Foreign Minister of Turkey. How did he explain the behavior and the actions of his country? They've already made a public comment in this regard. I don't have this habit of telling what was told me by my counterparts during diplomatic contacts. That's not something that we do. That's not our habit. That's a vice of our Western counterparts. As is known, countries of the region suffered a lot from the cluster munitions. For example, Russia held laws with uh, demining efforts after the use of cluster munitions. Such regional experience could help the West how criminal it is to supply cr such munitions to Ukraine. I don't think anything can help the West to see how counterproductive, how legitimate, how criminal things that they sometimes do, because the West will resolve their matters depending on the political expediency for a certain period of time. These are the rules that they want the world to be based on, and these rules are changing from one time to another. Not only Laos suffered from the classroom munitions during anti-colonial wars, Cambodia 
also suffered and the uh, demining efforts is still ongoing and we are helping Laos, we are training the miner sappers for Laos regularly and a lot of them and our technologies are being used. I met with the foreign minister of Laos. We talked about him, uh, about this topic, about the decision of the United States to supply cluster munitions to Ukraine. And Laos foreign ministry, they made a statement. They can talk against these risky steps. Thank you. Afrique Media, le monde, c'est nous.